for to everyone. Amen. Sister Pat, can you prop that door open? Just thank you. Amen. God is good. We are going to get into our message here this morning for Sunday school. Yeah, just for now. Yep, thank you. Amen. There's some folks coming in that are going to come in that door and they're going to get there and it's going to be locked, so I wanted to be open for them. Amen. So, gifts of the Spirit, week two, and we're going to finish it up this week. Uh, so we got a little bit of ground to cover, so we kind of fast-forwarded the timer this morning. Um, and we want to get through this because next week is our Christmas program on Sunday. It's going to be an awesome time, so you need to make sure you're here, make plans to attend next Sunday, amen, the 18th. And then the following Sunday, the 25th, we will have a Christmas Day service. We'll have worship and prayer and just a good move of the Holy Ghost, and we're going to do communion on that day, and we're just going to have a, a condensed service um, on that Christmas day because we know that people have plans and and there might be some people who have no plans and think I wonder if there's any services on Christmas day and there is so make sure you share that uh, with your friends with your family with your loved ones but we're going to get into 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 and it says Paul writing to the church and remember 1 Corinthians generally when there was a first and second letter the first one was a letter of correction or a letter of rebuke. There were some things that Paul had to address. Um, and then usually the second letter was a letter of uh, like an attaboy, right? Uh, commendation, good job. Um, but that's not to say that just because Galatians and Ephesians didn't have two letters that there wasn't any correction in it, okay? Um, so 1 Corinthians 12 and 1, Paul says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, because they needed to know, I would not have you ignorant. Because they were. Um, they were unlearned in it, is what that means. Uh, you know that you were Gentiles, carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. It's interesting that Paul said that, because later on uh, in James, or I'm sorry, John, one of the... Uh, John near the end of the book not the gospel of John but I believe it's first John he says don't believe every spirit but try the spirits to see whether they be of God and the way you do that is that no spirit that's of God will call Jesus a curse and every spirit that is of God is going to call says that Jesus came in the flesh or that Christ came in the flesh so he says now there are diversities of gifts in verse four but the same spirit there are differences of administrations but the same Lord diversities of operations but the same God which worketh all in all and again he's doing that to say you are on a level playing field it doesn't matter how you're operating how often you're operating what the circumstance how how small or big it may be in your eyes it's the same God it's not you it's him and we're just willing vessels to be used amen it says the manifestation of the spirit in verse 7 is given to every man to profit with all, to profit the whole body. So as individuals were using the gifts of the Spirit, it's to benefit the body of Christ. And then he starts listing them and going through them. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. We talked about that last week. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. We talked about that one as well. So we're going to pick up with faith. Everybody say faith. So faith is given by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healings. By the same Spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, and then he says, to another, diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one and selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So as God desires to do it, he shares it. He anoints, he uses people, he gives the gift. So... As I mentioned last week, it's God's will that his church is effective. Amen? He wants us to be effective in reaching people, in teaching people, in ministering to people. That's why it says in the Bible, in the New Testament, when the disciples went forth, they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. 
So as we're born again into his church, we should begin to understand that we can't do anything without Jesus Christ. Amen? Acts 1 and 8 said, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now that does not mean if you have not received the Holy Ghost according to what the, the book of Acts teaches, what that looks like, that doesn't mean you love God any less. It doesn't mean that your uh, relationship with God is any less than what it is. It just means that we need to come to an understanding, a revelation, a completion of the truth of God's word. So it's through being filled with the Spirit of Jesus that we can begin to mature in Him, as we talked about last month, concerning the fruit of the Spirit. But also, it's through that same Spirit that we can minister in the body of Christ and in our world through the gifts of the Spirit. Can you say amen? So last week we looked into other verses that mentioned the gifts that we receive from the Lord uh, that operate in us from kind of a natural understanding, whether it's hospitality, giving, cheerfulness, those types of things. Um, and then we also talked about the gifts of offices, like prof- the office of a prophet or of evangelist or a pastor or a teacher or an apostle. And today we're going to pick up with the gift of faith according to the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians. So everybody say faith. Now, some people may say, well, I have, I have faith. Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God has dealt to every man a measure, the Bible says, of faith. We're to add to our faith certain things, virtue, temperance, all those things. So what we need to begin to understand then is that this gift of faith is a little bit different than the measure of faith that everybody's given. It's a little bit different than the faith that comes by hearing the Word of God and experiencing the Word of God. It's a little different than the faith that we add to in our life through praying and fasting and such. The gift of faith is similar to our everyday faith and how it impacts us. But it's more like, uh, just for lack of a better uh, explanation or term, it's like a boost of supernatural faith that Jesus gives us for a particular moment or situation. Um, there have been stories, there has been testimonies of individuals that have done things uh, at a certain time when it was needed. They had faith to do something that normally on a regular basis they could not do through their regular faith. Hopefully everybody in here, we consider ourselves to have some level of faith, right? Okay, that's good. We all consider ourselves to have a level of faith. Um, Can anybody in here go out and uh, pick up a vehicle that's in the parking lot? No. But there have been testimonies of things that have happened similar to that where maybe an accident happens and somebody lifts up or moves a vehicle supernaturally to do something that God has used them to do. And I'm just using that kind of as an example. There's testimonies of that. Um, If you read through the Gospels, the apostles had some wonderful experiences with Jesus. Matthew 14 and 28, they're on a boat, and it's stormy. Jesus is walking from one shore to the other, and they see it. They think it's a ghost, and so what do they do? They begin to become afraid. Jesus kind of calls out to them, don't be afraid, it's me. And what does Jesus, or what does Peter say? Lord, if it's you, invite me to come out on the water with you. And what does he do? Sister Kelly, he gets out of the boat and he walks on water. Has anybody ever not walked on water? (laughs) What does that look like? (laughs) You ever fallen out of a boat? I remember a great men's retreat story that involved me and Brother Brian that I won't share publicly. (laughs) But we learned that day you can't walk on water. (laughs) Peter only ever walked on water that one time, unless it's frozen. Now, we can say, yeah, I walked on water, you know, in February in Wisconsin or northern Minnesota. But Peter walked on water one time because he had a, and of course, this is before the Holy Ghost was poured out. I understand that. But he had a supernatural boost of faith. There are other things that happen throughout the New Testament even after the day of Pentecost, where people had a supernatural boost of faith, where God did something 
and they responded supernaturally where it wasn't happening on a regular basis. Amen? And so he said, come, and when Peter's come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You cannot walk on water in the natural. Science proves it's not possible, right? But Peter walked on water. And of course, we know that when he almost got to Jesus, he starts looking around and he takes his eyes off Jesus and his, he begins to doubt. His faith begins to come into question and, and the Lord saves him. He says, why did you doubt? What happened to your faith? And so that is one supernatural gift and that's an example uh, of how it can take place in an instance but it doesn't mean that from that day on, Peter had the power to walk on water. It never says ever that he said, well, you know, I've done this. It doesn't even mention ever that he brought it up again. I don't know about you, but in our human nature today, we'd be posting that on every platform. We'd be signing up on new platforms just to share it. Oh, by the way, did you see this little Snapchat of me? Right? So another one then, after the gift of faith, gifts of healings. And much like it sounds, this is where Jesus will use an individual to lay hands on somebody, to pray for somebody, and they will be healed supernaturally. In Acts 28 and 8, Paul uh, is in a shipwreck. He gets on an island, and these people, don't, they're, they're pagan. They don't worship God. And it came to pass that the father of Publius, who was an individual there, was sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, the Bible says. He had a serious situation. He was bleeding in his, in his body. And Paul entered in and prayed and laid hands on him and healed him. This man was then healed miraculously. Everybody say miraculously. It, it was a gift of healing. Paul was used in the gift of healing. And so... The gifts of healing can use, be used in each and every one of us through God's Spirit. He also went on, I'm kind of getting through these because there's some that we're going to spend a little bit of time on today uh, just for clarification's sake. Uh, the next one, working of miracles. Now, healing and miracles are closely related, right? Um, Brother Scott, your knee was healed, but it was instantly so it could also be classified miraculously. It didn't happen over a process of time. It didn't happen that we know of anyway. You know, you went to the doctor the next day and the x-ray was different. There was cartilage there. There's been other, anybody else been healed like over a period of time where you had something in your body and you, it was healed over a period of time? And God did something miraculously in the gift of healing. But then mir miracles can take place that are a little different. Healing, again, can be immediate or over a period of time. A miracle is where something takes place instantaneously and supernaturally. Now, there are two different words used for our word miracle in the New Testament. One means an indication. Uh, for instance, um, when Stephen was preaching, they couldn't refuse him, and the miracles that he was doing, indications of things that were happening of the Spirit. And the other means like a supernatural force, a miraculous force so here's a uh, an example of the working of miracles in the new testament acts 20 and 9 paul was preaching as he often did he was in somebody's house it was a big house it was a big house rachel had three stories and as they often did in those they would people would sit wherever they could there's a young man had an interesting name his name was eutychus and he was sitting in the window. And Paul was preaching. And much like I have done in the past, and much like I've seen sometimes in this audience, as he's on here. Oh, I can remember when, uh, when, when the platform was a little different. We had four chairs up here, and the ministry team sat up on the platform. Brother Putnam would be preaching. Brother Pagel would be sitting in one. I'd be sitting in one. Maybe John David sitting in one. And I can remember sitting up there thinking, that can't happen now. <laughs> I cannot get dozy, dozy and cross-eyed because everybody is going to see me. And there'd be days I'd, I'd be like crossing my eyes and try, you know, just because I, so I get it. I've been there. 
So which is why every once in a while you may hear me lift up my voice just a little bit louder just to get somebody's attention. I won't call you out. (laughs) But anyway, Eutychus fell asleep. A deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, so Paul was a long-winded preacher, but he was effective. So he sunk down with sleep and he fell from the third loft and was taken up dead. Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him And said, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. God did a miracle through Paul. The Bible says special miracles were done through Paul of just taking a handkerchief that was prayed over and anointed. So, working of miracles is a gift of the Spirit. Prophecy. This means to foretell. Uh, Acts 11 and 28. A man named Agabus stood up and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. He told them. Why? So the church could prepare. So they could be ready. It was a prophetic foretelling from Agabus that there was going to be a drought. Uh, Another one, before we get into these last two that we're going to spend a little bit of time on, is the discerning of spirits. And this is important. Um, because sometimes people can come across as having good intentions or a good story, but we need to be led by the Spirit of God to know really what the Spirit is behind all of that. Kind of like a little red flag will go up, a little check in your spirit every once in a while. And we have to understand the nature of the Spirit at work in people's lives and in situations. Peter, in Acts chapter 8, addressed Simon the sorcerer, Philip had gone down to Samaria. The word of God was being preached. Miracles were being done. People were coming to the Lord, and Philip was baptizing them. But they hadn't received the Holy Ghost yet. So John and Peter come down, and they begin to pray for them and lay hands on them. And they begin to receive the Holy Ghost. Simon saw that something was happening. He saw the evidence of the Holy Ghost. He heard the evidence of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. He said, I want that ability. I want that power. And he said, sell me this power. And Peter rebuked him, and he corrected him. He says, I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So you have to remember, now Simon was deceiving much people in that area with his abilities, supernatural abilities from the from bad spiritual forces and now they come and are doing this positively in people's lives he had some things going on he says i i want to keep doing what i'm doing but if ever nobody wants what i have anymore i want what you got so i can do it i'll pay you for it and peter correct he he perceived that it was not from the right spirit the verse i talked about earlier first john four and one believe not every spirit but try the spirit's whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. How do you try a spirit? You pray. You be spiritually minded and spiritually led. Get into the Word of God. You ask questions. It doesn't always have to be uh, critical questions, or it doesn't have to be, um, you know, like, I don't trust you questions, but it could be sincere questions, just so you can understand better. So that is another gift of the spirit and then finally the last ones mentioned are diverse kinds of tongues which means speaking in a language you've never studied or learned before and then the interpretation of tongues and the reason i want to spend time on these uh, and i'm putting them together is because they work together amen first corinthians 4 27 14 and 27 paul said if any man speak in an unknown tongue Let it be by two, or at most by three. So there might be a kind of hush in the Spirit. Somebody might start speaking in tongues. Somebody else then might speak in tongues, and possibly a third person might speak in tongues. But And that, by course, let one interpret. So if there's a message in tongues, who's it for? The body, right? God is speaking to the body. And so there will be an interpretation of tongues. Now, sometimes it happens, especially if people may not um, have the understanding. There might be times when people are interceding for something, and they just begin speaking out very loudly in tongues. 
And everybody might think, if we're not aware, not spiritually led by what's going on, that we might think, oh, there should be an interpretation. And there may not be. Because sometimes they are just emotionally interceding for a situation or an individual. Travailing, right? And there may not be an interpretation. But if there is a message in tongues that is for the church body in this gift, then there should be an interpretation of tongues by one individual. And I want to finish up this lesson by clearing some things that are often misunderstood. There are, there are teachings out there. There are false prophets and false teachers out there. People that teach speaking in tongues is of the devil. There's people that speak, teach that speaking in tongues uh, is just a gift of the Spirit and not everybody gets it. There's people that teach that speaking in tongues was in the Bible, but it's not anymore today. Those are some different teachings about speaking in tongues that are out there. So we have to be aware. Paul is not against speaking in tongues. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, other than in one area, it says tongues will cease, right? Because it's talking about when Jesus comes back, there'll be no more need for that. We won't have to lay that foundation of salvation again, right? Because we'll be going into heaven. So we have to understand the context of the scripture, who's saying it, who they're talking to. So he's not against speaking in tongues. He's correcting inappropriate behavior in the church. And it's not because people are necessarily intentionally misbehaving. It's because they don't understand and they're getting caught up in spiritual things. It's exciting when spiritual things take place, right? And if God's moving and anointing different people and gifts of the Spirit and everybody wants it, that's a good thing. But we got Paul is correcting something. So he says in 14 and 5 of 1 Corinthians, I would, or it's my will, my desire, that you all spoke with tongues. But rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues. Why? Except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Because the whole point is that the church is edified. 14 and 13 says, uh, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So those speaking in the tongues comes from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And when it takes place, we don't understand the language. It could be an earthly language we never studied. It could be a heavenly language. It does not always mean it's for the same purpose. And we have to understand that. Speaking in tongues is just the vehicle that God uses. It's the sign that God uses. It's the, the gift that God uses. But it's not always for the same purpose. Diversities of gifts, different operations, different manifestations, right? Same with this. Uh, it has several purposes that we can categorize into three areas, or that I have categorized, okay, into three areas. This is, this is me. So one, speaking in tongues is for the evidence that a person has received the Holy Spirit baptism. When you look through the New Testament, beginning of the New Testament church, and I talked a little bit about this before, it talks about it being taught in Jerusalem and Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So it was for the Jews, it was for the Samaritans, it was for the Gentiles. So when the Jews received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, they spoke in tongues. When the Samaritans received the Holy Ghost in Acts 8, they spoke in tongues. When the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost in Acts 10, they spoke in tongues. It doesn't mean that every individual then throughout the rest of the book of Acts or whatever letter it is, that God necessarily specifies, yep, there was repentance, we can identify it perfectly, we can identify perfectly receiving the Holy Ghost, or being baptized in Jesus' name by immersion, and we can see uh, emphatically the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Because it was done for the nations. So we know that if God laid the foundation, He's going to continue with that same process. Amen? Just because it says later on... Uh, if you call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved, it doesn't mean God's changing the plan. That's part of it. Call on Jesus and you can be saved out of your situation. If you call on Jesus and, and obey him, you can be saved for salvation. You can be saved out of a, a, a sickness, right? And so Acts 2 and 4, here's a couple instances of receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues. Acts 2 and 4, the Jews, the followers of Jesus, the 120 in the upper room, were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues 
a language they had never studied before as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, on that day, God used it. There was, and people will say, well, there was an interpretation. No, there wasn't. They just spoke in an earthly language that Galileans and Medes and Persians and people that were from all over who gathered together in Jerusalem for the day of uh, Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, and they were said, how do we hear these all in our own dialect? Glorifying God, because God used that type of language. There's no interpretation given, but they just heard the wonderful works of God from these individuals. Acts 10 and 45, when... Um, Cornelius's household received the Holy Ghost. Peter was preaching, and while he was preaching, the Bible says the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard the word. Not just Cornelius and his family, but his friends. He had a group of people there. And it says in 10 and 45 that they of the circumcision, meaning the Jews, which believed, meaning the Jews that had already received the Holy Ghost and experienced this before, they were astonished as many as came with Peter. He wasn't no dummy. He wasn't going to a Gentile's house for lunch on his own because that was against the law of Moses. He wasn't sure about the whole thing anyway. God had to give him a vision and tell him to go. Cornelius had to receive an angelic visitor, say your prayers and your giving has come up as a memorial before God. Therefore, go and send for Peter. He'll tell you what you need to do. So the two visions and and spiritual things work together. Peter goes... And so these Jews that are with Peter, and Peter was astonished because that the Gentiles also has poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How do they know? God is a spirit. You can't see it. Did they dance because they were happy? Lots of things make us happy. Lots of things make us dance. What, did they, what happened? It says, for they heard, in verse 46, them speak with tongues and magnify God. So when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you will speak in tongues. Do we seek tongues to be saved? No, we seek Jesus to be saved. The evidence that he has come into our heart then, which follows salvation, doesn't precede it, it follows it, is speaking in other tongues. So that's one purpose for speaking in tongues. The second purpose, in a personal prayer life of someone who has received the Holy Ghost, a spirit-filled believer, in your personal prayer life, you can speak with tongues. And a couple verses, Romans 8 and 26. Likewise, the Spirit also, again, Romans is written to the church. The Spirit also helps our infirmities, our weakness, for we know not what to pray for as we ought. You ever had a situation where you don't know, I don't know what to say, I don't have the words? But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So sometimes we are just groaning sometimes we're speaking in tongues when we're praying when we're interceding when we're seeking the throne of god and this type of personal prayer life could include spiritual warfare it could include intercession it could include travail it could just include your daily walk with god so i'm kind of grouping all of those into the personal prayer life paul said in first corinthians 14 and 14 if i pray in an unknown tongue my spirit prays It's the Spirit praying through me. But my understanding is unfruitful. I don't know what I'm saying when I'm speaking in tongues, and I'm guessing you all don't either. Right? What is it then? He says, so what does this mean? If, if, If I pray in an unknown tongue and my spirit is, or my understanding is unfruitful, is it unnecessary? What is it? So he says in verse 15, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. There's times I'm going to pray and speak in tongues. There's times I'm going to pray and speak in English. Because I'm going to pray in the Spirit. I'm going to pray with understanding. And then he says, I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else, or else, when you shall bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen of thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what you're saying? He's correcting something. Everybody was speaking in tongues. Everybody had a psalm. Everybody had a word. Everybody had a prophecy. It was all in speaking in tongues. Nothing was being done to edify the church. It was all being done for the glory of the individual. So Paul had to correct it. And I'm finishing up here. The third one. During the operating of the Spirit to edify the body. And that's what we talked about. 1 Corinthians 14 and 27. I already mentioned. If any man speaks in an unknown tongue... Let it be by two or three at most, and that by course let one interpret. And, and I'll just close with this. 
In 1 Corinthians 14 and 18, Paul said, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. He wasn't condemning speaking in tongues. He's talking about ministering and edifying to the body. He says, in the church. 1 Corinthians 14 and 40, he closes that off with, let all things be done decently and in order. So, and, and I know, and I've heard, and I've met with people that think, well, I just don't have that. I've never spoken in tongues because I don't have that. I don't have the gift of tongues. It's not just in the gifts of the Spirit. It's the initial evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost. It's a vehicle and operation that God uses for different purposes in our lives. The gift of the Holy Ghost evidence of speaking in tongues is for everybody. Tongues in a prayer life is for everybody. But not everybody will be used in the gift of the Spirit and speak in tongues. Just like not everybody will be used in the gift of the Spirit and pray for people and miracles, but he gives severally to every man as he will. Amen? Amen. Jesus, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we just ask today that you would help us, God, to be led by your Spirit, filled with your Spirit, God, and to operate in your Spirit to edify your body, the church. We thank you. We ask your anointing on this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Service will begin in a few minutes.
them in prayer. Let's also pray for those who may not be doing well, feeling well, haven't seen in a while. Um, I know we can pray for the Oster family. We haven't seen them in a while. Let's keep them in prayer for, for that whole family, that household. We want to see them back with us. Let's play, pray for the Bachmans. Um, let's pray for anyone else we may be aware of who may not be feeling well, may have some sickness or some disease. Keep them under prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you've given us here this morning. We praise you. We want to thank you, Lord. Come into this house and give thanks. And I worship and give glory to your name that we have blessed you. Lord, that you would be the glory, that you would touch the Oster family. Lord, as the field covered up.
so good, so worthy of our praise. Amen. I have a couple announcements this morning. Um, so our ushers get ready to receive our offering this morning, so we're glad that you're here. If you are a guest and uh, you have not had the opportunity, we'd love for you to fill out a Connect card today, turn it back in. You can do that online as well, but we're so glad that you're with us. I'm excited to be in the presence of the Lord together today. Amen. 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 couple things coming up uh, the remainder of this month that we just want to make everybody aware of. There is a, a Google calendar that uh, is available online through our website. And I think there's a, a connection on Facebook as well. Uh, but some things we just want to be aware of and uh, things that are on there, other things that uh, we're just going to be promoting. One of those things is Christmas for Christ. And uh, I completely intended to have the Christmas for Christ envelopes out today. And I am struggling with where I put them. So I know we don't need an envelope to give to Christmas for Christ, but would you be prayerful? And we want to take up that, that offering uh, before the end of the month. So through our next couple services on Sunday and Wednesday, uh, if you would just be prayerful in what you could give to Christmas for Christ. It goes to planting new churches across North America is what this offering is for new churches and communities that don't have an apostolic Pentecostal church. I'm thankful that when I came to the church and I lived in this area, there was one here that had been planted uh, about eight years prior. I was so thankful for that. Amen. 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 God is so good. Amen. Amen. So we want to support Christmas for Christ. This is a, uh, a national offering that raises millions of dollars for planning new churches. And we do that here in Wisconsin as well. And uh, a lot of that stays here for new churches in Wisconsin. And some goes abroad for new churches. But we want to, we want to see the gospel spread. Amen. So be praying about your Christmas for Christ offering. And if there are no envelopes out there, if, if I can't find them, you can just write CFC on your offering envelope or Christmas offering, and we'll make sure that that gets to Christmas for Christ. There is prayer tonight. Amen. Amen. So we want to be here tonight for prayer, 6 o'clock. Wednesday, Bible study. We will have uh, our grow classes and our youth also on Wednesday. We're talking about spiritual gifts. If you have a young person or are a young person going to Winter Youth Convention, please get that payment in today. If you have any questions, you can see Rylan or Kaylee. Uh, Christmas program rehearsal is coming up Saturday, December 17th from 10 a.m. to noon. There will be food to follow uh, for those involved in that. And the program is the 18th at 10 a.m. And then there's going to be a cookie walk afterwards. So my wife spent almost all day yesterday making cookies, seven different kinds. Oh boy, oh boy, they need to get out of my house. They do, they do. Um, but uh, so for all you working hard over that oven, thank you for that. For all of you going to the grocery store and buying them, thank you for that. Amen. And so cookie walk after the program on the 18th. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board. The 21st, Wednesday the 21st, there will be no Bible study, but we will have service. It's going to be a social time. The youth have their Christmas party. We're going to have little treats and just a time to gather together, talk about the good things of God that he's done this year, excitement for next year. It's going to be pretty much just bring something. We'll have coffee and some drinks in the back. 
and we'll have a great evening on that Wednesday, the 21st. Amen? Amen. We will be having worship and service on Christmas Day, as I mentioned, along with communion. No service on Wednesday, the 28th, due to Winter Youth Convention, so that's why the 21st we're just having a social. Um, so really, the 25th will be our last service of the year, Christmas Day. How appropriate. Amen? And so... Uh, just a couple other things coming up. January 2023 is going to be a month of prayer and fasting. And Sister Vicki either has or is going to, she has it because she's on the ball. Amen. But there is a calendar. We want to start with a month of prayer and fasting to start 2023. Amen. So much like we sign up for those three days, we're, we want to see the whole month of January have a name to where we're going to pray that day, we're going to fast that day, and just believe God for something incredible. And then every month, it'll be on the calendars but there will, and promoted, but there will be three days beginning in the month. The first, with some minor exclusions, but pretty much the first Monday through Wednesday of every month throughout the year, we want to start that month with prayer and fasting, promoting our vision, amen, of allowing Christ to be formed in me, and this is all part of it. Amen. So just want to encourage you and remind you of those things coming up. Again, a lot of that information will be on social media or there will be paper calendars as well. Let's pray and ask God to bless and anoint this service today. There will be script cards available afterwards. If you need script cards for the holidays, uh, you can pick them up after service. You can see Sister Charlie or Sister Kaylee can help you out with that. Let's pray. Brother John, would you please pray for us today? Yes, we thank you, God. You're so good. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, use it, God, for your will. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. Let's continue to worship. Hallelujah.
majestic thing is you. You are forever. You are forever. You are the one that I run to. You are my treasure. You are my treasure. The only lasting thing is you. You are forever. You are forever. You are forever. You are the one. Never. 
at the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus. Oh, there's victory in the name of Jesus. Yes, hallelujah. Over every prodigal. Over every guest. Every stranger we haven't met yet. Oh, we call on Jesus. there is victory in the name of Jesus and if we're going to speak victory over every family and every situation that means we speak the name of Jesus over every family and over every situation over our communities over our government and our leaders over our nation and our world over our spouses and our children over our church family over our neighbors and communities we speak the name of Jesus against every stronghold, against every sickness or disease and addiction. We speak the name of Jesus against depression and anxiety, fear and doubt and worry. We speak the name that is above every name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, that He is Lord. Hallelujah. Why don't we just celebrate that name and worship that name right now. In Jesus' name, we praise you. We thank you. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. He is both Lord and Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. I appreciate the presence of Jesus in this place. Amen. The Bible calls him the one who inhabits the praises of Israel. So if we are worshiping Jesus, he shows up. Amen? That's why worship is so important. That's why, that's why music that is designated to the worship of God is so important. Because when you designate something towards the Spirit of God, he shows up. Now think about this on the other side. When I'm listening to something that does not designate worship to God, what shows up? I don't care if it's country. I don't care if it's the oldies. I don't care if it's good old the King Elvis himself. If I'm listening to something that is not promoting authority and worship and anointing to Jesus Christ and lifting up his name, something is going to show up. I prefer he shows up. Amen. Let's lift up his name again. Jesus, we praise you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we need you, God. Hallelujah. We praise your great name. Amen. I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 7. And then we're going to turn to the book of Matthew. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. The prophet is doing what he does best. He is prophesying. He is foretelling of a future event that will come to pass. 
and he writes and he says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. I don't know what the listeners of his day thought when he said that. Because I'm guessing he was speaking to an adult audience who understood how conception works. If somebody told you that a virgin, a young woman who had never been with a man intimately before was going to get pregnant. Of course, today we can write things off as science and we can figure those things out, right? We can, we can do whatever because we think we're so smart. But in their day, they understood what that meant. There's going to be a supernatural, miraculous conception. Matthew 1 and 20. Joseph is thinking about what's going on in his life. Wondering how he got there. And certainly wondering where he's going to go from here. His bride-to-be who he was engaged to and not yet married to not yet living with not yet intimate with had sprung a little news on him I'm going to have a baby and I'm sure she explained it and I'm sure his response was probably similar to the people in Isaiah's time I don't know if I buy it. And so he's thinking about this, and as he's thinking about what to do and how he can handle the situation, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. And it said, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth the Son, verse 21 says, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. She will bring forth the Son. His name shall be called Jesus. Because he's going to save his people from their sin. A couple of verses later in 23. They quote Isaiah 7 and 14. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. If you look that up in the original Hebrew, the Aramaic, it's with us is God. So this morning I just want to preach for a little bit about the only, the only saving birth the only saving birth can we pray together can we lift up our voice and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning and to help us brother Jamie Richard would you please pray thank you Jesus help us today God help us today God, to draw near to you Jesus in Jesus' name, amen. Let's clap our hands to the name that's above every name. Hallelujah, Jesus. I praise you, God. I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. There is something incredible about the name of Jesus. I realize that in our finite mind, it's difficult to understand things at times. I realize we have a hard time comprehending spiritual things because we are human and we have a human mind. So we need to be spiritually minded. I need to get into the Word of God and be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Can you say amen? I, I realize that uh, you know we may look at, at, at a nativity scene and see a, a young couple gathered around a little manger and having that baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and calling him Jesus and wondering how is that 
going to save me from anything, much less my own demise. How is that little infant, that little child, uh, going to come to a point where he is going to be able to save me from my sin? Uh, Is it going to be because his parents are are so incredible as parents and they are going to raise this young child up uh, to have all knowledge and to have all under? Is it going to be something that comes from the natural? No. There is something incredible not just about the flesh because we understand the purpose of the flesh and we have to get this in our mind we understand the purpose of God in the flesh and that was for a sacrifice for blood to be shed to save to pay the penalty of death for us but please don't misunderstand that because his flesh could die that it made his name any less Come on, somebody, don't, don't get in that mindset that he was just a man, he was just a prophet, and that his name was just, There is something powerful about the name that is above every name. That demons have to flee, that knees will bow, that tongues will confess, that he is Lord of lords, King of kings, and God Almighty. His was the only saving birth. Not just because of the flesh that was there for a sacrifice, but because the name of that God named him. That it was God with us. Jesus. It's the name. We can never forget the name. That's why, church, when we do worship and praise, like I mentioned a little bit ago, it is important. That is when, uh, you know, I hope that we understand, and I'll just make a little plug for the worship team because they do a wonderful job. They pray, they fast, they, 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 uh, they practice. They, do, they allow God to use them according to their vocal or musical abilities. But it's not just so that we can be entertained. See, the altar area is open all the time. Because when we worship and praise, we're bringing the sacrifice of praise to God at the altar but when we respond to the word we're laying down the struggle that the word is dealing with the flesh at the altar and Jesus is a name worth worshiping Jesus is a name worth bowing down to Jesus is a name worth edifying and lifting up Jesus is a name worth calling on and worshiping and praising with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength Jesus the only saving birth there's been some many amazing and incredible births throughout time in fact I would uh probably venture to say that every woman that has given birth to a child would say that it was an amazing thing that happened in my life or multiple children you could look at your children and say that was an amazing birth that was an incredible miraculous thing that just took place and so there are many births throughout time that uh, have been recognized or understood and, and been recorded uh, even miraculous births recorded throughout time Amen? Abraham and Sarah. You find the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and you read how God called them away from his family and away from the land he lived in and he he took his wife and his nephew Lot to go to the land of Canaan that God would show him a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that his descendants, which would span like the sands on the seashore, would own and and, and inhabit. Only a, a small problem... Even at the age of 100 years old, he hadn't had any descendants yet. And his wife was getting up there as well. She was a little bit younger, but in her 70s. No child. How would would his descendants uh, bless all nations of the earth? How would we be blessed today without this child to be born? And so as they're seeking God and as they're being led by God and trying to obey God, an angel comes and the angel of the Lord comes and he begins ministering to them, encouraging them and guiding them. And then one day they tell him, Ishmael is not going to be your son. 
that's going to be blessed of the promise. But I, you will have a son this time next year, and you shall call his name Isaac. She laughed. He wondered, how could this happen? How could this take place? How could this be? She had never been able to have children before. She was what they called barren. She was not able to have children. And then all of a sudden, now, near the end of their life, miraculously, she conceives and has a child. Tell me that Isaac wasn't a miraculous birth. Come on, somebody. Tell me that Isaac wasn't a miraculous birth. It was an incredible, it was notable, it was written down in the most important history book of all times. A miraculous birth. An important birth. Uh, not even Abraham and Sarah, but also Elkanah and Hannah. Who? <laughs> Elkanah and Hannah. Do you remember them? The book of Samuel. See, he had a couple of wives. And one of his wives was able to have kids. The important thing about a Jewish man and having children and especially sons was so that he could pass on everything he had to them. His name, his lineage, everything would go on. It was important to them. It was part of their culture. And so he had a, a, another wife. He was able to have children, but Hannah had no children. Now, he didn't need Hannah to have children to, to, to benefit him. And, and God didn't need Hannah to have children for Elkanah's uh, name to be preserved and for things to happen through his lineage. But one day, she found herself at an altar praying and seeking God. And she says, if you will give me a son, I'll give him back to you all the days of his life. And God said, deal. I'll do it. She gets pregnant. She has Samuel. She raises him. And when the time comes, she takes him to Eli the priest. Said, I'm keeping my word. And Samuel was raised to be one of the mightiest prophets of God that we can read about in the Bible through a miraculous birth. Can you say amen? Well, well of course. I mean, that's Abraham and Sarah. That's uh, Elkanah and, and, and Hannah. That's Samuel the prophet. I, somebody important. Of course God is going to do a miraculous birth and bring attention to himself in that. Well, what, what about some nobodies? Why doesn't anything ever happen for the nobodies? Why is it always the important people? Why is it always the why doesn't anything good ever happen for the nobodies? Well, there's, if we want to use that term, a nobody in the Bible. And her and her husband had no kids and couldn't have kids. Doesn't even really mention her name. She's just a Shunammite woman. She's from the land of Shunam. She wasn't even one of the promised. But when Elisha would come through their land, she would make him a meal. She would say, come on in, man of God. Let me help you along your journey. Let me minister to you. Let me bless you. And then she even told her husband, you know what? We've been seeing this man of God a lot, him and his servant. Let's build a little room on our house we got to understand some things here. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. In Jewish culture, the betrothed would, it would tell his fiancée and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to build an addition on Dad's place. I'll come and get you when it's ready and we'll be married. She was saying, I want relationship with the man of God in my life and in my home. So she built a room. She put a little bed in there, a place where he could come in and, and take a load off and maybe rest for a little bit and, and get a meal. And Elisha says, Gehazi, this woman is going out of her way. And I don't know why, but she's trying to bless us. What should we do for her? And Gehazi says, oh, they don't have any kids. He says, you're right. Woman, you're going to have a son. Don't mess with me. 
don't you dare mess with me about this. I've been disappointed for too long. I've been heartbroken too many times. He says, you're going to have a son this time. She had a son. Story even goes on that the son got sick and died. (laughs) And you know what she did? She told her husband, I'm going to get the man of God. He says, why? The boy is dead. She says, well, you put him in that room. I'm going to get the man of God. Gehazi comes to meet Elisha sees her far off says hey go go see if everything's all right with her uh, it's weird that she's coming to see us Gehazi goes is everything well she says everything's well have a good day I'm on a mission she says to Elijah I told you not to mess with me and now the boy is dead Elisha comes back and through a mir- miracle God raises a son back to life don't t- I mean, that's two miracles and one lad. Don't tell me God isn't into the miraculous birth. Amen? And even in the New Testament, Zacharias and Elizabeth, barren, can't have kids. And he's a priest. He's of the tribe of Levi. And he, he says... Angel comes, says, you're going to have a son. He says, I don't know how that's going to happen. He goes, well, just to show you, you're not going to be able to speak anymore until he's born. And you're going to name him John. And he's going to be the forerunner for the Messiah. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from the womb, the Bible says. Tell me that's not a miraculous birth. Tell me that's not something powerful that God did through nameable people and even the unnameable people of the Bible. But Isaac didn't save me. And Samuel didn't save anybody. And that boy with no name didn't save anybody. And even John the Baptist couldn't fill with the Holy Ghost, most greatest prophet since Moses. And he still became subject to the beheading of Herod. See, as miraculous And as incredible as those births were, there's only one saving birth. Come on, somebody. There is only one name under heaven given among men. There is only one that can save. Only one that can deliver. Only one that can help and heal. All of these were special and miraculous in their own way. Just as every birth is. But there has never been a saving birth like Jesus. Never before has a virgin delivered a child in the way that Mary delivered Jesus. Never before has there been a saving birth other than Him. Can you say amen? Amen. We've read the story of the nativity. We've heard it. We've seen the, the little demonstrations and we probably have the little figures in our homes and with our families. But when you really think about the story of the birth of Jesus... I alluded a little bit in our opening scriptures, but Luke 1 and 30, an angel, Gabriel, comes to Mary. She sees him, of course. If you see an angel, you know, don't pick on her because you're not going to be so strong yourself. If an angel shows up and he says, Mary, fear not, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. I don't know how much of that she heard the first time. But she said, how, you know, she didn't focus on being son of the highest. She didn't focus on the throne of David. She didn't focus on reigning over the house of Jacob. She didn't even think about of his kingdom there shall be no end. She says, I've never been with a man. How can this be? (laughs) She's thinking of the natural, practical situation in her own life. And the angel answered and said, the Holy Ghost... The Spirit of God shall come upon you, 
and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Verse 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. So here's a young woman, espoused to her fiancé, living in tough times, and she gets the news. Now, with everything else going on in her life, her, she knew the man she was marrying. She knew that he was not uh, a priest. She knew that he was not a lawyer. She knew that he was not uh, uh, some individual that had a great family wealth. He was a carpenter. She knew what she was getting. She knew life was going to be rough, but that was okay because she loved him. And she wanted to spend her life with him. She knew it wasn't going to be fame and glame and riches and glory. But now all of a sudden, now we got to add, and now we got to add a little controversy to it. Now we got to add a little, uh, you know, a little tabloid medicine to it. Now I'm going to be pregnant before I get married to Joseph. Think about the stress and the, and the things that she was going through. But yet God in his love and mercy said, you are going to have a son. And he is going to have a name that is above every name. It tells us in Matthew 1 and 18 that now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. It happened this way. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So now here's jo Joseph thinking, man, she's beautiful. She's everything I've ever wanted. her. She doesn't come from a great line of family. I'm still stuck having to deal with splinters and hitting my thumb. But I'm going to provide for her. I'm going to love her. I'm going to do the best that I can. And we're going to raise a family. And it's going to be all right. And then he gets the news. Well, now what do I do? Now what do I do? Well, how do I explain this? What am I going to do about this? And it says he was a just man. That means he, 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 he loved people. He had a good heart. He had good intentions. He could have easily been the type of individual that says, you know what, I'm going to profit off of this, and I'm going to go back to her family, and I'm going to sue them. They're going to owe me something because I'm not getting what I was promised. It's the way things kind of worked back then. But he wasn't willing to make her a public example. I mean, he could have said she should be stoned, according to the law of Moses. Could have. But he said, you know what? I'm going to keep this quiet. We're going to figure it out. I'm just going to kind of get it behind me. And everything will work out. And she'll be fine. And I'll be fine. And we'll just go our different directions. But while he thought about what he was going to do, how he was going to deal with it, maybe he wasn't even comfortable with that. But it says, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So here, they figure it out. They both got the confirming message. All right, this is a miracle. This is God. This isn't us. This isn't somebody else. This wasn't foul play. This wasn't any messing around, right? This was miraculous. This was prophecy being fulfilled that we heard about, that we know. This was Isaiah coming true, right? This was all of this happening, and now they're like, all right, so we can deal with this. We can handle it. I don't care what the tabloids ride. I don't care what, what anybody else says. I don't care about the situations and, and everything. We're going to get married. We're going to handle this. We're going to do it. But now, to add uh, more complications, in Luke 2 and 1, it come to pass in those days, there goes out a decree from Caesar Augustus. 
Oh, great. Now the government's going to get involved. Just what I needed. We've already got this situation going on. Now the government's going to complex things, and all the world should be taxed. So in order for the world to be taxed, it's kind of like that thing you get in the mail, and they say how many people are living in your household. Only they didn't have that back then. And so now they have to go to their hometown to be counted. The census was going to take place. But God was using this. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph now has to leave Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to go to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Sister Michelle, you do a lot with childbirth. What month would you consider being great with child? <laughs> Nine months. I mean, like, yeah, any minute, any day, we could be ready. We've been having contractions for a while, and there ain't no Braxton Hicks anymore. Things are moving. Things are getting ready. Uh, good news, honey. <laughs> going to do a little something to help maybe bring that baby out a little sooner. You're going to go for a donkey ride. Yeah, donkey ride. That'll get the baby out, right? Yeah. How pleasant does that sound? And so they have to journey, and they have to travel, and they get to Bethlehem. And they're going to have this baby. But because I'm sure of their finances, because of their limited traveling speed, they get there a little bit late. And what happens when you show up late to an event? All the rooms are taken. Nothing available. But graciously, the innkeeper says, I'll tell you what, there's a cave out back. Now we think stable, we think barn. It was probably a cave. Cave out back where the animals are. And, you know, we paint a pretty picture. Clean straw. But if everybody's in town coming to be taxed and their animals are there and they've been riding a while, they're sweaty, they're dirty, they're hungry, <laughs> and then they get a byproduct of being hungry. All of that. I was raised on a farm. I know the byproduct of cows being hungry. It's not pleasant. And so here they are in that place, ready to give birth. Ready to present to the world the Savior of our souls. <laughs> there was no announcement in the papers. There was no... Uh, you know, beautiful, lavish room and meal provided for the king and his family. But you know what there was? There were some shepherds out keeping watch. And all of a sudden the sky parts and it's no longer night. And angels singing and praising God and telling them, you need to go see this great thing. Because this is the only time that a baby's been born in this manner. This is the only saving birth. You're not just going to see a child. You're not just going to see somebody important. You're going to see the Son of God. So in all those challenges, we think about that. Even, even after the birth in the manger, in the stable, in the cave, even after that, the greatest challenge for Mary would come about 33 years later. Luke 22 and 25 says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same was a just, devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. This is Luke chapter 2 still. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. 
And he came by the Spirit into the temple when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law. See, when the child would be so old, they would bring him to the priest to be circumcised and offer an offering, usually a lamb, but if you can't afford a lamb, two, two small pigeons, which is what they brought for Jesus. Why? Because he had to be redeemed, right? According to the law of Moses. Look it up. It's in Exodus. And he came by the Spirit in the temple when they brought Jesus in. And he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us, thou servant, depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you had prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the... Gen- He's saying this, and the parents are listening. They've already had nine months ago a, a pretty revelatory message. And now they're getting another one. Now they finally got through all that, and the baby's born, and they're taking him to the temple. Finally, we can get on with our lives. And then this old Simeon dude shows up. And he's blessed God. Lord, let your servant depart in peace. Let me depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles. You're probably thinking, what? Why are you mentioning them? Why are you mentioning them while you're holding my son? (laughs) These were Jewish people, right? And a glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Verse 35, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Jesus' birth, the only the only saving birth. And because of the birth of our Savior that we'll be remembering and celebrating in just a couple weeks, anybody out there excited for Christmas? Yes. Yes. Girls over there in the pew, are you excited for Christmas? Woo, yep, little hand waving up. I'm excited for Christmas. In just a couple weeks, we're going to be We're going to be celebrating that. But I think the most important thing to recognize, church, is that we too can experience a saving birth. Amen? We too can experience a saving birth through Jesus Christ because of what he came to do. In John 3 and 1, it tells us that there, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. No one can do what you're doing unless God is with them. And Jesus said, except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. He's, now he's got a question about birth. He says, I've been around some. I've got kids. Can you enter a second time and be born again into the womb? And Jesus said, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say you must be born again. The wind blows where you hear it, and you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. So is everyone that's born of the spirit. You must be born again. And because of that miraculous saving birth that we're going to celebrate that took place 2,000 some years ago, today I can experience a saving new birth. You stand with me today. In Matthew 16 and 18, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure, asking who do men say that I am? And he says to Peter, he says, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it, but I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And in Acts 2.38, Peter used those keys, speaking to the crowd that was now in Jerusalem for a different reason. 
They were in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, the celebrating of the giving of the law, the feast. The Holy Ghost is poured out, signifying the God putting the, His law in their hearts. They begin to speak with other tongues like we talked about in Sunday school, magnifying and glorifying God. And people said, what does this mean? See, 33 some years had passed since that first birth in that city, in that area, right? 33 years had passed since that story of that quote-unquote supposed virgin giving birth to the Son of God. 33 years had passed, and he had given his life and died and was buried and rose again. And they said, what must we do? If Jesus, the one we crucified, that was the only saving birth, the only way we could be saved, and we killed him, what, what must we do? And Peter said, well, before you killed him, he gave me some keys. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he did testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Paul later wrote in Romans 14 and 17, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Would you bow your heads with me today? You see, Jesus' birth was the only saving birth. He's the only one that can save us. No one can come to the Father but through Him. He is the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is our Savior. He's the one that purchased us back. He paid the penalty of death for our sins. His flesh was sinless and perfect before God. Therefore, He was the only sacrifice that would meet the requirement to cover the sin of the world. When He took upon Himself our guilt, our shame, our stain, everything we'd experienced in this life, His was the only saving birth. And the reason He came was so that we too could experience a new birth in our life. An opportunity to repent of our sins, dying out to our will, saying, God, I don't want to live for me anymore. I want to live for you. Being buried with Him in baptism and resurrected by His Spirit living inside of us. As I quoted Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Paul said in Romans 6 and 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. I am so thankful for His saving birth. We celebrate it every year. We gather together in our homes with our families. We decorate extravagantly. We exchange gifts and we sing songs and tell stories, eat together. So I just want to encourage us today that while we're doing all of that, you know, I, I have no problem with that. I, I, I think it's all right to celebrate His birth. I realize where some of the customs and traditions have come from. Yes, I get it. But I realize the motive and the heart of why we're doing it. 
But there's only one thing he said to do in remembrance of him, and we're going to do that on Christmas Day, and that's taking communion together to remember what he did. So I say that as we gather together this holiday season with loved ones and family, please don't forget. Please remember. Please promote and celebrate the saving birth that Jesus gave to us by expressing our worship and praise to Him through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This altar is open. Can we find a place today to pray and to thank God and to give ourselves once again over to Him and say, God, I love You. Lord, I'm thankful for what You've done for me. If you need to find a place to repent, then this is the place. Just saying, God, I want to turn my heart, my mind, my life over to You. Once again, God, I've made some mistakes since I've been with You last, Jesus. I need to repent. I need Your forgiveness because Yours is the only saving birth. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, after repentance, then I want to encourage you that this is a place where you can be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and take on the likeness of His burial so that we can experience His new birth. If you need to be filled or refilled with His Spirit, the evidence of speaking in other tongues, if you want to spend some time praying and worshiping Him, then I encourage you. His is the only saving birth.